I am Dr. Sridhar Kalyana Sundaram. Welcome to my channel. Uh, in the previous video in this series, I had explained why the premature baby is at increased risk of developing neurodevelopmental problems. In this video, we will be looking at what is the risk actually of developing these problems and what type of problems can happen. So, who are the babies who are at risk of developing neurodevelopmental problems? Any baby who is born has a slight risk, but it's not a well-defined risk and then we know it's a matter of chance. However, we can define this group of babies where there is an increased risk and we need to monitor them closely for their development. So the premature babies, especially the very preterm, which is 28 to 32 weeks and the extreme preterm babies under 28 weeks, the more premature the baby, the higher the risk of neurodevelopmental problems. The late preterm babies between 33 and 36 weeks are at risk, but it's more subtle and usually this is manifest only at more prolonged follow-up because the subtle changes are not picked up in the beginning. When they start school, for example, you may have a higher risk of slight learning difficulty or attention deficit or autistic spectrum and so on. The babies with HAE due to birth asphyxia, these are usually full-term babies and when the HAE is stage 2 or 3, there is an increased chance of the brain being affected. When we have symptomatic neonatal hypoglycemia, uh, kernicterus due to severe neonatal jaundice or severe neonatal hypernatremia, you have a high chance of brain injury. But thankfully, all these three can be monitored and prevented by timely intervention. And most of the units have policies in place to avoid any problems from these. Neonatal seizures are due to various factors. And uh, obviously, any seizure can lead to brain injury. Infections uh, and neonatal meningitis have an increased risk. Herpes uh, meningitis or meningoencephalitis is very serious also and uh, it has a significant neurodevelopmental sequel problems. Hydrocephalus uh, due to various factors. It may be post-hemorrhagic, it may be uh, congenital hydrocephalus, it may be associated with brain developmental issues and we may have congenital anomalies affecting the brain directly as well. So in the extreme preterm babies, nearly 40 to 50 percent of the survivors are normal. 20 to 30 percent have mild to moderate developmental concerns and 10 to 20 percent have severe problems. So if you are looking at babies under 28 weeks, all of them have a similar range of problems. The survival rate depends on the gestation. You can review my video on the preterm baby to get more of this information. In the very premature babies, that is the 28 to 32 week babies, there is a 5 to 8 percent risk of severe concern. So it's still a significant risk, but it's much lower than the 10 to 20 percent chance of severe concerns in the much smaller babies. And uh, you have a 10 to 20 percent risk instead of the 20 to 30 percent risk of mild to moderate concerns. Again, the smaller the baby is, it is in that weight range, the higher the risk. The brain scan abnormalities and things add to this risk. So if you have a periventricular leukomalacia, for example, your risk of uh, severe concerns goes up from 20% to 60-70%. So that is where the brain scan abnormalities would fit into this system. In HIE, if you have stage 2 to 3, obviously stage 3 has a very high risk of mortality and stage 2 has a high risk of sequel in 40-50% to 50 babies. Similar outcome in neonatal seizures, uh, we can't predict exactly the subtle seizures may have no significant uh, impact and if it is a transient hypocalcemia, it's a good prognosis, but hypoglycemic seizures has a poor prognosis as well. And uh, in the rest of the causes of seizures, it depends on the severity and the underlying factors. So what can we do to support our diagnosis and to prognosticate? We have the cranial ultrasound, which is routinely used in the premature babies. Most units do a scan from day 0 to 1 and then repeat at day 3 to 7 and then at weekly or two weekly intervals according to the scan findings uh, till the baby reaches 34 weeks or so. The late scans are important to pick up findings like periventricular leukomalacia. The MRI scan of the brain is more sensitive to pick up changes more than the cranial ultrasound but because of the technical difficulty, the time taken, the need to fast the baby and so on and the sedation as well, it's not done routinely and the cost is inhibitive as well. So you might consider a pre-discharge MRI scan in a preterm baby with cranial ultrasound abnormality or someone who has neurologic abnormalities and also in babies with congenital anomalies involving the brain or with HIE. Uh, both these are supportive but they are not definitive. So when we speak to families about the neurodevelopmental outcome, you have to be clear that the brain is plastic, it can adapt 
If one area of the brain loses the function, the other area can support and take over some of the function. So there are babies where we have seen even with significant MRI abnormality and they may come and uh, they may develop normal. There is also the other side where you have a normal MRI but the baby comes back with significant neurological problems. So you can't be sure both ways. The most important thing is that don't lose hope, stay positive as best as you can and update the parents at each stage as we monitor their development. So it's very important not to be too negative even with an abnormal MRI because you know that some of these babies may come back normal. So the main neurodevelopmental concerns that we face in the small babies can be cerebral palsy which is usually a disorder of movement. So you have stiffness or uh, hypotonia in some babies. It can affect the lower limbs mainly when it's called a spastic diplegia. It may be affecting one half of the body when it's called a hemiplegia. It may be a right or a left hemiplegia. You may have all four limbs affected with quadriplegia. Most of these quadriplegic babies have a very small head because the brain size is shrunk and that is called microcephaly. You may also have the chorioathetoid type of cerebral palsy mostly after the neonatal jaundice related brain injury. In addition to the movement related problems, you may have severe deafness, severe visual loss, both of which are categorized as major neurodevelopmental problems, epilepsy which doesn't respond well to treatment, severe pervasive disorder like severe spectrum of autism, severe categories of motor coordination disorder or severe learning difficulties. So the learning difficulty is usually IQ based. If it is less than 70, it is severe. And we have the gross motor function classification system. A score of four to five would make it severe as well. So these are ways to categorize a major neurodevelopmental concern. And I gave you the percentage risk of the major concerns in terms of HAE. We say 40 to 50 percent risk of moderate to severe. So you can put both these groups that I'll discuss next as well. So this is just to give you a brief summary of what we mean by the gross motor function classification system because it's a useful way of functionally defining your disability. So if you have a level one functioning, you work without restrictions. There are some limitations in the advanced gross motor skills. So stage two is I mean, level two is where you can walk without assistive device. However, you have a limitation in walking outdoors. And level three is where you need a handheld assistive mobility device and you have limitations in going outside. So you're dependent on people once you go to level three and above. Level four is where you have self mobility with limitation and they need power uh, mobility or they need to be transported. Level 5 is severely limited even with the use of assistive technology. So different levels of disability from the different sequel that we discussed. So we have mild to moderate neurodevelopmental concerns where you have specific learning difficulty, dyslexia, etc. These are usually picked up when the child gets older. You may have lower levels of involvement in gross motor scale like 2 to 3 or IQ based scoring 70 to 100 score. You may have specific coordination problems like apraxia may have less severe visual or hearing concerns. It's not blindness or deafness, but to a lower level of problems. The seizures which are well controlled with treatment, milder cerebral palsy and milder pervasive disorders fit in the mild to moderate concerns. Uh, the most important thing is to look at the child and the family as one unit. We need to support every child to achieve the best possible level of functioning. And for that, we need multidisciplinary input. We will be discussing that in the next video as to the neurodevelopmental follow-up and rehabilitation services. So I hope uh, this video is useful and you're following the series. I request you to subscribe if you have not already done. And these are very important topics and please share it with your colleagues. Thank you.